after they started the kindergarten at Fraser, John Ed's office was in the middle of the church and there was there were no windows. So he backed up to a hallway and he could hear all the little kids in the hallway. And he never let anybody call him Dr. Matheson or Mr. Matheson. It was always John Ed. And these little kids would come by and say, John Ed, John Ed, and he loved it. And I said, where'd that come from? And he said he had a coach one time that said, my name, and he gave the coach his name, and that's what we called him. We called him by his first name. And John Ed said, I decided right then I was going to always be John Ed. I came here to Fraser when I was 36 years old. The bishop called. It was in the middle of the year, and they had to make some moves. We said, would you consider going to Fraser? I didn't know anything about it. I said, well, let me pray about that. I did know the music director here. Well, I called the music director and he said, uh, hey, I know why you're calling. We told the bishop to call you. I said, you do? I said, how long will you stay at Fraser? Because in my opinion, the, the most important relationship has to be the music and the ministry. And if that's not together, you're gonna have problems. He said, John Ed, if you come, I'll stay as long as you stay. I said, well, hey, that I'm coming. So I told the bishop the next day I'm coming. He said, well, I want to thank you. He said, you were the third person we asked to go there. I said, wait a minute, why didn't you tell me that? I had two kids and I was married to Joan. And we just sort of took things as they came. The good thing about Fraser was I didn't inherit a large church. When I went there, it was just a very, very small church. When I got there, I, I fell in love with it and I sort of committed, I'm gonna be here for a long time. And we began to grow together as a church and as a family. There was nothing out here except cotton fields. That's why everybody said that church will never make it. Never make it out there in that cotton field. And uh, this church was very open and it was very evangelistic in the sense that we're here not to have business as usual, but to grow the kingdom of God, to invite people, to win people to Christ and His kingdom, and to disciple them. A church has got to want to grow, to grow. And the people were willing to do everything they could to make this church grow. The church uh, was having a little bit of a hard time because the uh, area in the neighborhood was going down and a lot of the people that came to Frazier had moved out from the area. Plus the fact that they'd come in with uh, Interstate 85. It uh, took a lot of homes out. The uh, District Superintendent Powers McLeod came to us and said, we know we've given you the land out on Narrow Lane Road to build a church and to move to, but Asbury United Methodist Church got in the same difficulties that we did, and we've decided to give them the property and want y'all to disband and go and join uh, other churches. Our membership, which was strong with lay leadership, said, no, we're not going to do that, especially the pastor, Noah Lisby, said, you better find us a place to move to church. We're not going to disband. A few days later, they came back and said, we got uh, five acres of land out on the line of highway that we're willing to give you if y'all want to move out there, but I'm telling you, it's out in an area where there's nothing else. There's no houses. It's nothing but a cotton field. We had a lot of, a lot of choir members. We were known as a singing church. We sang a lot. And if you look back at the history, you'll see that, that music and preaching made up uh, Frazier at that time. So when you think about where Frazier sits today, it's, it's really by, uh, by the Holy Spirit that it's there because the bishop at the time was uh, really, and the cabinet was considering closing Frazier. 
because it was downtown on Clayton Street and a uh, dwindling uh, congregation. Uh, this thought about moving it out to where it is to now. It was out in the country, you know, is that, is, a, is that a strategic good move? And so there was a lot of discussion about just closing it. Well, just pause and think if that would have happened, we wouldn't be sitting here probably talking about what we're talking about today. So when I think about that as a bishop, uh, it just uh, it leads me to say, you know, you've got to look at what the Holy Spirit is doing and what God is leading rather than just what your own agenda is sometimes. One day, this preacher came to our door, and uh, his name was John Ed Matheson, and he was pastor of Fraser Church, and it had just moved out to where it is on Atlanta Highway, and he was out doing what preachers did in that day, knocking on doors looking for members. And so he came to our house, and um, when he knocked on the door, my mom answered the door, and uh, John Ed said, in the only way that John Ed can, hi, I'm John Ed Matheson, and I'm the pastor of Fraser United Methodist Church, and uh, I would love to, to talk with y'all. And Being from the big city of Atlanta, you just didn't let anybody in your door, and especially somebody who said they were a preacher. My mom said, hold on just a minute, and she yelled back to my dad and said, hey, Mike, there's some preacher here who wants to talk to us. And, and my dad said, tell him to go away. Thankfully, uh, later on, John Ed connected with my parents. We started going to Frazier, and then uh, John Ed led my parents to the Lord. Uh, because of that, my sister and I would become believers. I can remember worshiping in what is now the chapel. And you know, it used to just be a little sanctuary with an education wing, and uh, there was you know 165 people here, and you know, and it was very traditional. And then all I remember is growth. John Ed was here a matter of weeks, and they had to go to two services. Uh, they took in over 100 members the first year he was here. John Ed's message early on to the people was that the church is not a building; it's you. You're the church. Uh, and that began to uh, reshape how people thought about themselves, how they identified as a Christian, how they identified as someone who attended Fraser. And there was a responsibility that was felt that was very systemic, very systemic. It was in the whole system that, that, no, I do have this mantle on me. I am a follower of Christ. I do need to live that out in some way. God has given me gifts and the Holy Spirit, and I can actually do that. I, I can actually be a part of building the kingdom here. From the early days, that's what began to shape Frazier, and then it took off from there. The first thing that John Ed needed was uh, permission. As any uh, new young pastor needs, uh, you need permission to do things a little different. It was an exciting thing, the church grew. One thing I learned quite quickly that was so important Number one, you better have good staff. And you don't hire staff ever to do ministry. You only hire staff to train and equip lay people to do ministry. And that became a sort of a mantra of every member is a minister. It was just growing so fast. He put such an emphasis on uh, volunteering and of course, if you know John Ed, it, he, he called it volunteering because that was kind of a user-friendly way of, of hearing that. But he, what he was really doing was inviting people into discipleship. He found a way for you to use your gift. If you didn't think you had any gift at all, he would find something in the church that you could do and felt good about doing and made you want to do it. He wanted everybody involved and on every level. And, and I think that that, that nurtured uh, a commitment by people. John Ed gave me a lot of responsibility, like he did people uh, who had a knack for things. He would uh, categorize them, at what they could handle, and then let them go and encourage them from the sidelines. He was so good at that. Loretta Daughtry and I asked if we could start a kindergarten here. The churches were starting kindergartens and we thought Frazier would be a great place. The neighborhood was growing. John Ed came to me he had been off somewhere and they had started a children's ministry so he came back to Montgomery and thought Frazier needed a children's ministry and I want you to start one. I took the job as the director of the children's ministry and we just took off from then. 
while John Ed had all the permission he needed uh, to be innovative and do things a little different, uh, he turned right back around and gave permission to all the people uh, to serve however God was leading them to serve, uh, which was uh, amazing. And he had the audacity to cast a vision that every person could serve, which was very unique if you think about it in, in its time. You know, you're thinking about the 70s and 80s. Um, there still is a very heavy kind of professionalism around clergy, uh, around the position itself. And quickly, John Ed picked up on this theme that every person could serve in ministry. And that became the mantra. And it, it not only changed Fraser, it not only impacted the city and the river region, it changed how churches, both in the US and all around the world, thought about church. It was radically different. Fraser was a very large church in the mid 80s. You can see there was a lot of upside at that time too. There were a lot of plans to continue you know, ministry is in reaching out and expanding where we needed to go. So it was just very dynamic from the, from the time we got here to this day. I think it's always had a vision of what it could be doing, you know, in the times ahead. Every member of ministry was John Ed's big thing, and it was very, very successful because people felt like they had an involvement in the church. You know, when you can bring four, five, six thousand people together and, and have them all working for the same thing, that, that's incredible. And, and that that's the, was the growth of the church back then. It was exciting to be here. We came and first thing we know, we loved it. And the next thing we know, he said, John Ed came and saw us and he said, uh, now you know we're gonna put you in ushering and, and, and collecting the offering plate. And I said, really? He said, oh yeah, we, you're gonna get to work. We use everyone for uh, their certain talents and of everybody, is, everybody is needed in, in, in the house of the Lord. One of the things he did was really reformat worship services to really connect with uh, the audience that, that, you, that you were trying to engage with. The personal testimonies that people would give, um, lay people reading the scripture, uh, engaging other people in the element of worship, those concepts were new concepts back then. Joe Pat Cox uh, was a, he was just as much of an instrument in what was happening there. Joe Pat grew up in Fraser, and at 15, he was the worship leader here. Now, let me tell you, my daddy always told me, he said that it's very, very, very difficult to find a music person who is good at music, who's got religion, and can get along with people. He said generally they can do one or two of those. Joe Pat could do all three of them, and he was like an associate pastor. He taught a Sunday school class. I mean, he, he was a... He wasn't just the music guy off here. We were in ministry together. They were just kind of hand in glove because, um, and for the next, you know, 36 years, um, they were at work together and Joe Pat stayed there a total of 40 years. And to watch them do ministry, you know what the most interesting part was? Is that they never had a meeting. He was my best friend. Uh, we were, we never had a crossword. Uh, I don't know if that was because he always let me have my way in doing everything, but we just felt we, when we planned and talked about worship each Sunday, we were on the same page. He was actually at Minister of Music for 55 years, counting when he started at 15 years old as a part-time. My dad worked for the highway department of Florida and uh, lived in Pensacola. When uh, my mother was pregnant with me, God was dealing with him about the ministry. He didn't have any education or anything. And somewhere about the time I was born or so, he made the commitment to go into the Methodist ministry. I was in about the fourth grade. I was about 10 years old before he finished college. I remember going to my daddy's graduation at Huntington College. We had a youth week at my church in Opelika, and at the end of the youth week, the, the, the invitation was given for people for church-related vocation, which could be ministry or anything. And I just felt strong, that's what God was calling me to be. Now, my dad was a pastor. For that reason, I was a little more reluctant. I don't want folks to think, well, I'm following him but it was very, very clear to me that God wanted me to do something in ministry. 
So I was in the 10th, 11th grade when I made a commitment to go into Christian ministry. Uh, I went to Emory, to seminary, and one day I was down on the track jogging, and it was about in October, first quarter, and so uh, there was this guy trying to jog, and I, I, I tell him I passed him a couple of times, met him, we got to be friends. Uh, his name was George Hunter. Uh, and so my roommate dropped out of seminary the first quarter and his roommate dropped out. So the second quarter, when I got back from Christmas, he was in the room. He said, we're going to room together. So we roomed together for three years at Emory. And then we both had excellent grades and all of that. And he said, why don't we go? We're going into ministry. Let's go to an Ivy League do a graduate degree. So he said, what about Princeton? I said, that sounds good. We prayed about it about 10 seconds. We both applied and got in and went to Princeton. And then I came back and did the doctor ministry at Emory. He went to Northwestern and then went to Asbury Seminary. He's written more books probably than anybody in the, area, in the Methodist Church in the area of evangelism. And he was head of the uh, East Stanley Jones School of Mission or, wh or whatever. He did missiology and evangelism. And so we've remained good, good friends. Do you know what the task of the church is this morning? It's not just to comfort the afflicted, but it is to afflict the comfortable. And sometimes we just sit back and we want somebody just to take care of us. And God comes in prodding and nudging and disturbing. You see, what God wants is not something temporary, but something permanent. And he ain't going to ever let you and me settle for that that's just temporary. John Ed's preaching uh, obviously was one thing that he was just so engaging, so, um, you know, he was always leading to a decision, you know, when it came to his preaching. So many people changing their life, coming to Christ uh, because of that. I think that was a real important part of that. John Ed was also just somebody that was um, very attractive in the way that he, people wanted to know John Ed. They wanted to be around him, you know, and he just had that charismatic style about him. Plus, he was a very savvy leader. You know, he just, you know, God had gifted John Ed with the ability to lead and to really, you know, kind of see where the future of the growth was going and to say, we need to go there. I guess there are two things that came out of what we did here. One was probably the Joel task force. Joel was a prophet who dreamed dreams and see visions. And early on, I started out and brought together a group of lay people, the Joel group, and we would set the vision for the church for the next four or five years. And that group could visualize. They were a lot smarter than I was, but they would set the vision. And then they would report to the administrative board and they would adopt the vision. Then we'd give it to the church the next Sunday in the bulletin. Everybody in the church knew where this church was going in the next four to five years. The question of the day is, uh, during that time, is like, who's casting the vision? You know, is it the leader casting the vision or does it come from the people or the stakeholders? And John had just basically said, well, why didn't it come from everybody? Let's put everybody around the table and let's figure out how we can pray and discern for who God wants us to be in this season. Uh, and so you see this happening in different ways playing out throughout the story um, that's uh, just very innovative and very different. But the impact of it, particularly in Methodism, was astronomical. And all of a sudden you had clergy leaders and churches thinking, well, maybe we can do things a little different. They said, Methodists don't have any, any kind of presence on television nationally. Uh, why don't we look at doing that? And the Joel group said, well, let's, let's look for that for the future. And we all thought it'd be 10, 15, 20 years out. Well, they presented that to the board. 
they said fine, they presented it to the church. Would you believe about a year later, the opportunity came locally to do a television ministry? Jerry Kemp, uh, who was the original uh, manager, I guess you would say, uh, director of the uh, TV ministry here, I went to John Ed and uh, approached him with that idea of having our own TV station rather than relying on somebody else's equipment. And John Ed uh, is all, always is and has been an innovative, forward-looking man. So he said, Jerry, I think that's, that's a good possibility. What Fraser was able to do under John Ed's leadership is take a television station and then partner with others and then go worldwide. So you had someone who was able not to, not just impacting Montgomery, not just the river region, not just Alabama, but literally the United States and then literally around the world. Uh, so much so that, you know, John Ed would be recognizable in an airport in Europe. If you appreciate this service of worship or if it means something special to you, would you write me and share that? And would you call someone and ask them to watch with you? We'll be on this channel at this time every Sunday. God bless you. We were in over 40 million homes uh, every week. And our whole TV ministry was run by volunteers. The Axe Network, uh, we were able to get on that, and then ES, ISPN, uh, not ESPN, ISPN, that put us all over the country. And then it just continued to grow, that vision for television. John Ed received a letter from a man in uh, Chicago. And uh, at the time, we were telecasting all over. and. Uh, he, he told John Ed that he had been complete, uh, com, been contemplating suicide, and he was flipping through the channels and happened to turn on Frasier. And at that point, John Ed was absolutely a, a terrific preacher, and. Uh, Whatever he said on that particular Sunday prevented him from, this man, from committing suicide. I was in the car driving on a three hour drive back in the day when there was no cell phone and there was no Pandora and there was no satellite radio and there was no way to keep your mind occupied except to listen to the radio. And um, it was Sunday, and the only thing on was church, and there were no other options. And as it happened, I was swipping, flipping the channels trying to find something other than church to listen to, and I heard John Ed's voice. And I said, oh, I've been to his church. I've visited there before. That's John Ed. I'll listen to him. And as it happened, he preached about Paul and he preached about a Jew of Jews. And as he preached that sermon, I just remember pondering that three hour drive over and over again, like, okay, that sounds a lot like me. And that sounds a lot like this missing puzzle piece in my life. I grew up in a Jewish home. So to um, come to Christ was a big deal. I don't know anyone, really, uh, that is, uh, I don't even quite know how to put it, who is as uh, uh, capable uh, and as uh, really brilliant in terms of sharing the gospel and teaching, and yet at the same time is uh, uh, so simple in his presentations. Uh, they, you can't not understand the gospel that he preaches. Uh, and yet he preaches that gospel uh, in a convincing, a complete kind of way. John Ed didn't try to 
come in there with a bulldog like, Doug, you're sinning, and Doug, you're doing this wrong, and Doug, your life ain't on the right path, and you need to stop some of these things you're doing. He didn't do that. He came in and just kind of fit in with me, uh, didn't try to ram the gospel down my throat. Uh, but what he did do is show me what a real man should be. Uh, how a real man could really live his life. His storytelling, uh, his love, um, just even his athletic background, you know, it just it just coincides with you know with with, uh, with uh, who am I am with, with, uh, with who am I am today, and I just really appreciate him, and I just owe him everything, you know, because um, if, if it wasn't him, you know, with, with, uh, with his motivational speeches and, and um, stories. I won't be where I'm at, you know, because it was a rough situation, uh, you know, uh, during that particular time, you know, because during that time uh, here in John Ed, I was, you know, I was going through the, the foster care program, and, and um, so like, like it definitely um, impacted my life. I have to tell you about this time that for sports, he was playing in a tennis tournament in here, and he had to be there at 12:30. Church is over at noon. So John Ed literally would wear his tennis clothes under his robe at that time. They wore robes. I would leave during the last song and go crank the car and be in the parking lot. And the minute they did the benediction, he was out the side door and got in the car and he was there ready to make his first serve. So we had he had it timed. He knew exactly how long it would take him to get there. He's a great athlete. Uh, great, was a great basketball player, great tennis player, has won all sorts of uh, senior tennis championships. But he, uh, he uses those gifts that you don't normally associate with giftedness for ministry. You know, I, I've experienced John Ed's competitiveness. You know, he a great tennis player. Uh, pickleball player, you name it, he is he is a competitor, and part of that uh, competition uh, that drives athletes and coaches is one reason I believe he resonates so well uh, in FCA because he understands that a competitor can get out of sorts, or motives can can uh, get in the wrong direction, but also if we put that spirit of competition against the real enemy, the devil and we rally together as God's family. We understand that the battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities, powers, and darkness. And we got the opportunity to take the light of the gospel. And I think John's competitive, John Ed's competitive spirit is one that he stayed focused on the true battle, and that's to build God's kingdom against darkness, to bring the light and hope of the gospel to a very dark and dying world that needs Jesus. When we began FCA in the early days, the vision was first to get FCA on as many campuses as possible. And John Ed's influence in the lives of coaches in Montgomery um, helped open that door very quickly for us. I can remember watching uh, John Ed on Frasier TV and every time he had the opportunity, he spoke about FCA and its impact on our campuses. And that exposure through John Ed preaching and teaching around the state and around the world and on TV really gave FCA a platform and gave FCA a favor. Uh, early in those days, um, John Ed sponsored a coaches ministry conference and he brought in big name speakers and we invited all the coaches in the city and within about an hour radius to come in. We had great attendance. And John Ed used his influence to speak into those coaches, man, we want to support you and allow you to use your influence as a coach to impact your campus for Christ. I found a lump under my arm. I went to the doctor. He said, let's get it out, and we did. The surgeon leaned over me when he took it out, and he said, Joan, you have a malignant tumor in your lymph node. And I saw the alarm on his face. I knew it was serious. And the serious part was we didn't know where it was coming from. So that meant extensive tests for several days. And during that time, it was just a time of unknown, just like hanging in limbo. There was no encouragement. No one could help me. It was just like waiting to see what they found. They were, we were very happy to find that all the tests came back negative, And they were very pleased to know that it was in a localized area. 
Because of that, it led to a modified mastectomy, which I underwent Friday two weeks ago. The doctors have told me with treatment, I have a 70% chance of cure, and I'm going for the cure. But there's always that 30% chance that I won't be cured. And I don't know, but I'm not going to worry about it. The one thing I do know is that God loves me, and he loves you too. And there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. And we need to claim that and understand that he is ours, and we are his, and he is all we need. Thank you. Joan was diagnosed with uh, breast cancer and uh, uh, she had surgery and, and then that worked for about four years and then she was sitting talking on the phone one day to a, a little girl who was a special child and she had been relating to her and it was then that uh, all of a sudden she discovered that maybe the cancer had reoccurred. And so then went through a lot of treatment. We went to Birmingham for six weeks and had a bone marrow transplant. And uh, there was marvelous, marvelous people in the church that did everything. And at that time, my kids were in college and so, uh, or and getting out of college. But uh, she went through that. And then she, about, Two or three months after she got back home, it sort of reoccurred, and she died in 1992. Uh, now, that was a transition for all of us. People look to my dad, and you, you know, I mean, in terms of crisis, to see how he handles it, and, you know, I mean, he, he you know, he, he handled it probably, you know, better than, you know, you know anybody that I know. I mean, I don't know if you'd say it brought the church together, you know, but it just, you know, it was just, it would, it would probably be different today, you know, you know, just because everybody has so much other stuff going on. But, you know, but at that time, you know, I mean, just, I mean, literally chairs in the aisle and the whole, you know, the, the whole entire choir up there, you know, you probably had double the amount of people, you know, that you were supposed to have. and. Um, you know, so it, it was something special. The church was just ultra supportive, very, very, very supportive in every way. And I discovered how important it was to be a part of a community of faith because I wasn't the minister, I was ministered to. I would like to thank all of you for being here. Joan planned this. She said, I want to go to the gravesite first and I'm supposed to leave here because he lives, because that's what it's about. Over in the Fellowship Hall, I'd like you to come and spend a little time and visit together. Now, she was a people person, she heard some poems, she wrote a little book, and there are a lot of delightful things in there. If you'd like to remember her, we have a lot of them out here. We'd like for you to take one, one for family, please. But when you read The Delight and the Talent, I hadn't read this in a while. We sat down the last few weeks and we read it. You would enjoy it. And appreciate her. I thank you so much for being here. She loved this church. She loved you so much. She loved this choir. She loved music. She loved children. The last time she attended a worship, she didn't feel like it. She came home Sunday night to be a part of that celebration. I want to say to you, Si and Vicky and myself, how much we love and appreciate your love. I want to say to you that I know, I know that you might have believed. I'm persuaded that he's able to keep all that any of us have ever committed unto him against that day. And I know that neither life, nor death, nor powers, nor principalities, nor anything present, nor anything to come, nothing, nothing, nothing can ever separate us from the love of God. When I came to Fraser, I knew Joan, and she was a beautiful woman and very well respected. I was there for her when they had her service. It was a celebration service. It was beautiful. It was Mother's Day. The church did a tour to Israel 
And during that tour to Israel, we went to uh, a lot of different places and there was this rug place. And I'm a decorator by profession and so I thought, I'm gonna get these rugs for a client I'm doing. I got ready to purchase them, it was time for the bus to leave. And uh, so I couldn't get them, so I just had to let it be. Well, that night we got to Egypt to the laser show, and John Ed comes to the back of the bus, and he says, Lynn, do you want those rugs? And I said, well, I didn't bring the tools to get it. I didn't bring my money or my card. And he said, well, do you want the rugs? And I said, well, yes, but I can't. He said, do you want the rugs? So he let everybody else get off the bus. And he went with me and helped me secure those rugs. And then we went to the laser show by ourselves. Well, he held my hand that night, and I thought, oh, this is the man I've been praying for. I've been I prayed to be a preacher's wife because my daddy used to speak at um, country churches, and I would play the piano, and it was just always in me. And I had been praying and answering a call to God that I was open to that, but I didn't know I was praying that it would be John Ed. And very interestingly, when we got married, uh, all four kids got married within about a year and a half. We had five weddings in less than two years. If you're going to put the Fraser story in context, I think you got to have two things in mind. Uh, one is you have a historic city called Montgomery but you also have what became a historic figure, and that's John Ed. In that context, um, you have the city of Montgomery that is not just the capital of Alabama, uh, but you're talking about the epicenter of the civil rights movement. You know, at that time, Montgomery was struggling uh, with segregation. And what does it mean? What does it look like to diversify? What does it look like to value diversity? Frazier was on a similar trajectory as well, where all of a sudden you had a church that, where African Americans were not just welcomed, they were wanted. And so you began to see even uh, different staff people and leaders who were African American. And all of that was, uh, I think, attributed to the way John Ed handled those conversations. Some people transcend color lines, race, uh, race lines, uh, political lines, and I think John Ed is one of those people. I would consider John Ed to be one of the leaders with race relations here in Montgomery. Um, he sits at tables and not only sits at tables, he invites everyone around the table for discussion. Um, you know, you can see the genuine spirit of John Ed, whether that's coming up behind me at a football game and just starting a random conversation or inviting me for an intentional conversation over coffee uh, just to talk about how I feel or the plight of Montgomery, Alabama. So I definitely think he's at the forefront of race relations and it's, it didn't just start. I mean, he's been doing this for years. Frazier's at a unique point in its history, but we're not only a unique point in, in history uh, for us as a church, but also the city of Montgomery and what is taking place, or in some cases not taking place here. Um, with everything that's going on in the world right now and all the tension around particular issues, Montgomery has been very calm in so many ways. And a lot of that has to do with the leadership that's been in place in Montgomery, uh, mainly and particularly in churches. I would just remember when George Floyd incident was going on in America, Janet called me <laughs> and we say we got to do something. And at that point, we called the other pastors. Actually, he called a couple and I called a couple and we formed a team. And that's how it happened. But Janet knew that something needed to happen before, you know, the crisis hit Montgomery. And he stepped out, put his neck out, put his reputation out, and step out in front, in front of the camera and start leading the city, you know, to build a relationship together and make us know that, hey, listen, we're sad about what's going on. We really don't approve of anybody being mistreated, but let's come together as a people and stand against anything that we see that's not like Christ. And that's the father, that's the leadership that he's always provided. He's never been on the side of anything that was wrong. He could stand up no matter who it looked like, what it was. He will always stand and say, hey, listen, this is wrong. And we as a people have to stand against anything that's not like Christ.
the success at Frazier and the success of this individual's life. We celebrate what you have meant to this community, to this state, to this country, to this world by the way we now live our lives. Let us live up to that standard. Brother, I love you, and I want you to know that you've made a difference in people's lives unlike very few people I have ever met. And for that, we are eternally grateful. Thank you very much. Retirement was obvious because the Methodist Church had mandatory retirement at age 70. And so as I approached that and began to look at it, um, some folks said, well, what, what are you going to do in retirement? And I want to be, I, I just said, Lord, I just want to be used, but I hadn't done a lot of creative thinking. And they said, why don't you train pastors? I said, that, okay. And so we formed a nonprofit. My board figured up we've trained about 11,000 pastors in that time, so I've had a great time. Traveled around the world, I did a lot in Europe, in South America. I was a part of Dr. Bill Bright's vision to start five million churches, win a billion new believers, and my responsibility was in India. I went there four or five times. If you look at this church, John Ed has been so instrumental in building it and developing it, and this is a wonderful, wonderful church, but it's a faithful church. It's faithful in how it teaches about Christ. I think people respect him tremendously for what he's accomplished and what he's continuing to do. And he's really living in his dad's footsteps, and his dad continued ministry way into his latter years, and John Ed's right there with it. And uh, I don't think he's missing a beat. I think he's still revered as a, a tremendous pastor and a Christian leader and he's still going strong, he expects to. I think he, go, I think he gets up every day looking for another opportunity to, to influence one and, and lead people to the Lord and, and do his job. And it's just, uh, there's no slowing down. I think he, he'll know that when the Lord calls him home one day, I believe he'll slow down, but until that time, I think he will continue to do what he does best, and that's influence people and touch their lives. I think it's the personal influence John has had on people's lives. Uh, in a way of doing ministry, in a way of loving, in a way of clearly preaching the gospel, and a way of being involved in the community, that that continues in the lives of um, of, of other ministers that, that he's influenced, and and it continues in the lives of the people that they influence as well. What he has been able to share, what the Lord has given him in his heart, and in his in his in in his witness is that others will be used. And that's what he's done for the world. There's so many missionaries out there that were, that were brought up in this church. There were so many fine brothers and sisters in Christ that have gone through Emmaus walks, that have, that have been brought up in this church. There's so many one-on-one -on -one groups that are brought up in this church that are expanding the territory of Christ. His legacy is not being a senior pastor at Fraser, It's not the preacher that went to India to preach. It is the fact that he gave everything on the line to follow God's path, no matter what it was. He was so okay with being uncomfortable that he went anywhere he had to go to touch people's hearts. He was so willing to put his life down for Jesus. He was willing to give everything away for Jesus, and that's the legacy he leaves. Someone, a servant, who is so willing to do anything for Jesus, and people can see that through his life, and that will touch people's life, and that is the thing that will make people live for Jesus.